it brings me back to a time in my life, my time when, it, when I lived in peace and comfort and safety, and I felt protected by my family. And, uh, excuse me. That was probably the safest time in my life. Barbara McNabb Larson still remembers the day it changed. And I remember when they came to get us from here. The first year we uh, went in a livestock truck. And the next year? They came out with a, uh, an army truck. And they drove us back to the school and these trucks and they unloaded us like we were just little animals. She is one of thousands forced through the doors for nearly 80 years of Kamloops Residential School. The first things they did was they took us down to our cleansing room where they cut off our hair. Then they deloused us. Then they scrubbed us down with disinfectant like we were diseased animals. Sorry. The name of the institution is now known worldwide. Students always suspected children were buried here, and now they are reliving the horror. For three days, I went into a depression so deep. And a grief that I never knew I had. No cross or stone and scarce information to mark who lies buried here. It's going to be Christmas, and we want to get all ready for Christmas, don't we? The Catholic Order Sisters of St. Anne's taught at the school. We have knowledge of maybe about 20 children that died in the school over that 80-year period. Sister Marie Zeroni belongs to the order. So there is a hint in the records of another cemetery connected to the school, but we don't know where. I actually don't know if that reference comes from that school or from another school. At Canloops Residential School, the threat of death hung in the air. You better behave. Don't get out of line because there's the graveyard. And there's also the river. Those were warnings that were given to us as little tiny children, five, six years old. Death was real here. We do know how some of these children died. Records from the 1930s were shared with us. Leslie Lewis, nine-year-old boy, died from an epileptic seizure. The Indian agent filed a report noting the overcrowded conditions in the institution. During an epidemic, it is impossible to properly isolate the patient in contacts. The need for separate quarters to house sick children is evident. I wanted to go home and I was weeping. I remember there's a train whistle. The trains would go by Kamloops and I'd hear the whistle. And it became one of my triggers later on after I left a residential school. You know, I'll tell you the truth. That years of residential school was like a blur to me. The suicide, you know, I remember this young man or young boy hung himself in the bathroom. Still today, they remember that. They still get nightmares about it. And about the runaways and people jumping trains, getting killed, jumping a train, you know, freezing outside, running away in the wintertime. There was another girl, Florence Morgan, whose age is not noted, died from a viral infection. The Indian agent reported her body was returned home by truck. And that's one of the things about um, life lessons. Say, for example, uh, when you got the strap the first time, I sounded like a coyote howling and crying. Um, the second time, not much so than uh, the third time. I, uh, he wanted me to cry. And I said, I'm not gonna cry. And I went and found a nice uh, spot where there was nobody around and then I had to cry. Some never made it home. The girl's name was Mary Francois, age not noted. Died in hospital from a blood clot in her brain. Her father, chief of the Adams Lake Band, who only saw her after death, 
wrote a letter requesting when a child of the school is taken sick and requires hospital attention that the parent be notified at once. The community gathered testimonials in this book. You're growing up, you're not allowed to do something. I wasn't allowed to read this book. Mike McKenzie reads a passage from survivor James Child. I walked along the river bank and I found that student floating in the water by the shore. His body was stiff. For finding that deceased person, I was strapped 150 times on each hand. I think there was a few times that happened. Mackenzie's father's story is also in here. My dad, Terry Denault, went to the, uh, we call him Shinny, and he went to the Kamloops Indian Residential School. We were so young, we didn't know where to turn for help. I was whipped so many times that eventually you get so tough that you block those things out and you can't feel things. That's how it was here. This oral history fills a gap between the still incomplete record of the residential school era. Many records were pulped by the federal government, including from Kamloops. Funeral records destroyed, Indian agent reports destroyed, student lists destroyed. Those records were not highly, um, highly valued in terms of being preserved uh, from, uh, you know, the, from, from the recycling process that went on. John Malloy, an author and historian who worked for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. A lot of that information was simply lost. He said Indian Affairs officials sometimes failed to record information. We report uh, abuse of these children to you when you don't do anything about it, and therefore we're not going to be bothered reporting to you any longer. The same lack of care accompanied the death of children. Children died, children were buried, uh, parents were not necessarily told that they had died. Children were buried in unmarked graves, uh, adjacent to the schools oftentimes. Death a part of life in residential schools. But there's one institution with key information still in the shadows. There were records kept by nuns and records kept by uh, priests um, and, and sort of diaries. And the claim was made that these were personal documents, right? Zeroni says a fire at the school destroyed the first 30 years of records. She said they have opened their archives to aid in the search. But as for letting outsiders sift through the more personal files... I, I would need to know what, what it is they're looking for, and no, we wouldn't just turn them all over. But the one history that can never be hidden is the one carried by those who came home. I call upon all our people across our Turtle Island, all of our First Nations. It doesn't matter whether you're a Mohawk or a Cree or a Dene or a Shushwak or a Kitkiskan. We're all one people. We're one nation, and it is our cultural and traditional strength, I believe, that has allowed us to carry on and to live. Jorge, Canadian Cardinal Thomas Collins and the Prime Minister seem to disagree over whether the church did hand over records from residential schools. What did your research show? Well, they're kind of both right. Most Catholic entities, including the Old Blades who ran Camden's residential school, turn over records to the Truth and, and Reconciliation Commission. But about 17 didn't. What none of them turned over were personnel files, like priest discipline reports, transfers, diaries that itemize daily life in residential schools. And I've spoken to some who work for the TRC who say it's time to give an independent body subpoena powers to search all church archives in Canada. And why did the government of Canada destroy some of the records? Well, it was an issue of priorities. Indian Affairs prioritized records around land and band membership lists. So they, when they were faced with edicts to, dis, to recycle paper because of paper shortages, they saw residential school records as expendable. But we don't even have an idea of what was lost because the government also destroyed files that described the records that were pulped. Thanks, Jorge.